thank you so much for joining me to talk about this exciting news. First off, before we really get anywhere, Kelly, you're an astronaut now. How does it feel? I'm so excited to fly to space. It's, you know, I, I've been sharing a lot of my story on social media for a really long time, talking about the aspiration of wanting to fly to space, wanting to become an astronaut, especially not coming from perhaps the most traditional background and entering this industry from more of the, you know, communications and policy side, and then really traversing over into the research side years ago. And so I think this is, you know, obviously a dream come true for me, but I think it's also a really important precedent for the next generation of researchers and scientists and astronauts who are going to be able to use these platforms like Virgin Galactic to, you know, achieve all of their research goal and their personal goals of becoming astronauts and flying to space and doing something that in the past only handfuls of humans have had the opportunity to do. Absolutely. So like you mentioned, you've had a pretty incredible and pretty varied history up until this point between your research at the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences to your work as a science communicator in a number of mediums, now including TikTok. <laughs> um, could you tell me a bit how your work has prepared you for this mission and how you landed yourself in the seat of a payload specialist for Virgin Galactic? Yeah, absolutely. So on the science communication side, I've always been such a, a vocal advocate of the commercial space flight industry, you know, because of what drew me to the industry in the first place, which is the promise of civilians like myself being able to access space and the mission of visionary companies like Virgin Galactic that are enabling it. So that whole like melting pot was a recipe for, I want to be a part of this. I want to help enable this. I want to help progress and advance those missions. And in doing so, and Sarisha and I worked together at the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And that was really my first entree into, you know, the world of the commercial space flight industry. And so through, you know, advancing that message and amplifying it on social media, I've really been able to reach um, both space folks and non-space folks sort of in the, in the broader public and try to bring them along for the ride. Because, um, you know, like I write about in my book, I do believe that our next giant leap will require the talents of, you know, artists, engineers, and everyone in between. It really is a multidisciplinary next giant step for humanity. And so I, I think, you know, the TikToks, the Instagrams, you know, it, it's funny, I think people expect me to maybe feel offended when a headline comes out that says like TikToker going to space, you know, as though it's like reductionist somehow. I don't feel that way. I think it's awesome. I view TikTok as another great science communication tool. And so I'm really, really happy that I have these platforms to connect with people and to, you know, share my aspirations and help, you know, buoy theirs because I, I think everyone has, you know, this unique opportunity in history to like achieve things that weren't possible decades ago. Absolutely. Both, both personally and professionally, I, I very much appreciate that perspective. Um, so, you know, and, and Sarisha, feel free to jump in um, if you have anything to add throughout. Um, this next question might, might defer to both of you, uh, depending on how you want to answer, but I'm curious about some of the specifics of your flight. I, I'm curious, when do you expect to potentially take off what might your flight be like? Where will it go? Who might be on board? How long will it last? Um, and if you could tell me a bit about the research that you have planned to do on board and if that might be changed or added to between now and the flight itself. Totally. I'll let Sarisha handle the first half of that on the Virgin specific <laughs> things, and then I'll jump in on all of the research specific stuff. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately, we can't share any details on the future flight schedule. Um, and who else or what else would be on it. Um, so we're just not sharing those details on the manifest, but the flight will be taking off and landing from Spaceport America um, in New Mexico. Um, that's our hub of commercial operations and uh, will continue to be a hub of our commercial operations moving forward. Um, and the flight typically lasts anywhere from like 60 to um, um, probably 60 to 75, I know that's really specific, but like 60 to 75 minutes. It really depends on how long it takes to get to altitude depending on the weather that day. Um, and then of course, I think you're familiar with our flight profile where we have a, a hybrid system with an aircraft and a spacecraft. So the aircraft will carry up our spaceship class of vehicles to a high altitude release. Um, the spacecraft will then light its rocket motor for 60 seconds. And that is enough to take spaceship two to apogee. And there we'll have three to four minutes of microgravity time where Kelly's going to do her work and her research, which I'll uh, let her talk about. And then we glide back 
uh, to Spaceport America um, and land on the runway. Fantastic. I, I get chills even hearing about it. And obviously, <laughs> I know all of this information, but I'm so excited. Um, yeah, so the, the research that I'm going to be doing is a continuation of a lot of the research that I've been working on with IIAS for the past few years. And so one of those is a biomonitoring experiment. It's like a, a smart undergarment that I'll wear underneath my Virgin Galactic flight suit, and it's called the AstroSkin Biomonitor Wearable Sensor System. And it was developed by a Canadian um, company, Kare Technologies, and the commercial version of the product was called Hexoskin. And, you know, that's something that athletes have worn, um, you know, folks in the military, and it really is designed to capture biometric data um, about, you know, various environments and their effect on the human body. Well, that company partnered with the Canadian Space Agency to develop the AstroSkin, which is the astronaut version of this. And um, astronauts wear it right now on the International Space Station. The cool part about it is that we, because it's been sent up previously only in cargo flights, we've never had someone wear it through launch and re-entry and, and landing. And so that will be novel data collection. Um, and it'll help inform, you know, how does the environment of space and the rigors of space flight affect, you know, the average civilian, you know, body future space flight participants. And so I'm excited for that. Um, that's one piece. And then the other uh, one that I can talk about right now is a fluid dynamics experiment. So it's designed to see basically how does liquid behave in a confined environment in microgravity. And so I have this small cylinder that I'll be carrying and it has a little platform with like a GoPro style camera attached to it. And I'm aiming to free float that for like 30 seconds to a minute, um, because in the past our parabolic flights, you know, here on earth have only allowed us like chunks of seconds at a time to get that data. So I want that like consecutive uninterrupted time. And then I'll also be manipulating it in real time, like tapping the cylinder, disrupting, you know, the liquid and really being the human tended part of the human tended research. <laughs> um, so I'm pumped about that. And the cool applications of that research are, you know, um, fluid dynamics are really important to understand like the behavior of liquids in space for everything like how do we administer medicine in space in the future through like syringes because if you just try to suck up water you you might suck up air too and that could be deadly um, or like you know Luca Parmitano's helmet when it flooded like emergencies like that life support systems to, to just understand more about the behavior of liquid in space. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that research is really far reaching in its applications. That must be really exciting to, to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm thrilled, you know, and it, it's an amazing opportunity. And, you know, both of these experiments, like I mentioned, have previous spaceflight heritage and the, the fluid dynamics one actually went up um, on a space shuttle, I think like 25 years ago, but it was not human tended at the time. And it was um, in Iraq kind of close to the wing of the shuttle. And so there was a lot of vibration, you know, happening. So this will help validate some, some previous data, you know, in a, in a more controlled environment, basically. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think the human tending portion of the research um, moving forward is gonna be really exciting and really interesting to watch. Um, it's something that hasn't been offered um, for space flight. Um, typically, you know, you have a payload and you would give it to a payload specialist that works at a government agency or a government body, and they would have like the test card, um, the instruction card to do what you need to do to engage or activate the payload. So now you were able to fly researchers with their own payload. They have the most intimate knowledge of how it works, how it's supposed to be working, so they can make real time decisions, real time observations, and, and you know, and, and um, uh, in what the, Kelly's doing, if you look at the fluid experiment, like to um, just tap it is so simple. But if you were to make that an autonomous payload, you'd be making a whole contraption to, uh, you know, activate it when it gets into the microgravity portion, and um, you know, put in the right inputs, and it just becomes complex, much more complex than it needs to be sometimes. Um, so that human tending is able to reduce complexity for payloads and just offer this whole new world of. Uh, microgravity and space-based research. So it's going to be really exciting. Very exciting. Now, Kelly, you've done quite a bit of research in the air already. So <laughs> you have an idea of what to expect in some capacity. How do you think this flight to full-blown space now, crossing, the, crossing that boundary to space might differ from your previous experience flying high into Earth's atmosphere? Uh, and kind of along those same lines, how do you think it might feel to become an astronaut, go to space, and come back to Earth all within the same day. This is a pretty novel experience, even when it comes to human spaceflight. 
Yeah, totally. It's going to be the best day of my life. I can say that like without reserve. I, I know that for a fact. I'm already like fully prepared. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. I think I am, you know, I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to have so much time here on earth in microgravity, just because I, you know, I, I, I know, I think it'll help me as a researcher because things are different. It's like, you know, you're not used to, you, you know, obviously humans are not used to the environment of microgravity, but like when you put something down, it doesn't stay there, it floats away. And so when you have these precious minutes to like work with your payload and conduct experiments in space, it's like, it's very helpful that I have all of that experience, you know, knowing basically how I react and how things react in the environment of microgravity. And I will continue to do a lot of training with my payloads up until that point to make sure we are like ready for game day. And, you know, that all of my payloads are operating exactly the way they intended, like, you know, de-risking basically the, the risk that a sensor gets displaced, you know, during takeoff because we didn't, you know, account for the high pressure <laughs> that would be on it or something. It's like, I want to make sure that we test all of that here on earth well before the flight so that, you know, that part will go perfectly. And then of course, with the Virgin Galactic team, we'll choreograph every second of the flight to make sure, you know, all of my movements in the cabin, you know, both for safety reasons and to make sure we maximize our like scientific return um, will be really carefully choreographed. And I will, to the second part of your question, be baking in like at least a full minute in that choreography just to like look out the window and be in space and, and just like soak in that moment, you know, and like appreciate the profundity of it. Like you pointed out, like it is a novel experience i know that you know this is just the beginning it's it's going to be repeatable affordable accessible uh, you know it's just the beginning of the next you know era of space exploration and so i i want to soak that moment in and so i'm going to bake that into my <laughs> my plan good i'm glad you're doing that it's very important totally um, <laughs> now you mentioned kind of this new era of space flight um that that leads into my next question, actually. You know, this news comes as the inspiration for astronauts prepare for launch, and as in general, commercial space flight, specifically crewed commercial launches, become more frequent, become more expected, become less of an, oh my gosh, it's not a space agency. It's just becoming much more of the mainstream. And the space industry is really changing. How do you feel it changing from your perspective now, you know, so in this, um, and I, you know, if, if Sarisha wants to add at all, of course, from the Virgin Galactic perspective, I'm, I'm sure things are changing quite fast. Totally. Yeah. You know, I, I look around and I feel like I, I have never known so many, you know, not only women in space and, you know, leadership positions, yourself included, it's like, you look around the industry and it's like, wow, you know, there it's, you know, the, the, the sort of representation is changing, you know, and, and that's such an important and like meaningful thing. And then on the actual launch side, it's like, I've never known so many friends who are going to space. It's like, it's happening, you know, it, it's, it's just like, it's one of those pinch yourself moments, not, not just for me, but, but I, I think for the sort of like pipeline of opportunity, it's like, we've all kind of been waiting, you know, for this moment. And I think we've all been like big believers in, in that, the fact that we would get here as an industry. And now it's like, here we are, it's happening. It's like, we're retweeting and celebrating the achievements of all of our friends, you know? And so that's just a really special, like personal takeaway that I, that I've had. And um, yeah, I, I think it's it's just one of those things where like when I look at Twitter and I look at people who have like Astro something is their handle, or I look at people whose bio says future astronaut or aspiring astronauts, like I believe them. Like I have literally no reason not to believe in them. Um, and you know, I certainly felt the same way for the last 10 years. So it's really cool. Yeah. And I think, sure. yeah, and I think you'll see, I mean, I'm really excited to see what the downstream effects are gonna, of this are gonna be, especially you know, in addition to researchers, we have, you know, 600 plus um, a tourism, a future astronaut tourism customers, and all of them, you know, come from, I mean, they come from different backgrounds, they come from different geographic areas, um, countries that don't typically have a domestic uh, space flight program, and they're all going to go to space, have this amazing, beautiful experience of seeing the curvature of Earth, um, and then they're going to be going back to their own communities. And a lot of those communities will not have had access to someone that's gone to space. And whether that's from an education perspective or 
encouraging non-traditional um, careers to go into the aerospace industry, I think that kind of, that effect that we'll see downstream is going to be incredible too. Yeah, I, I think that's such an important, important point. And I, I would just add like, because it made me think, you know, in, in the past, it's like space flight had to focus only on function, right? And now we're at this point where it can also focus on experience and, you know, and optimize for experience. And so to Sarisha's point, it's like the next generation of astronauts won't all be engineers. And I think that's an incredible thing. Like I want to see the, the poets, the journalists, the athletes, the musicians, the you know, I, I want them to go and then come back and, you know, really bake that experience into their own disciplines because that we need, it's a multidisciplinary effort. Absolutely. Hey, as a journalist and musician, I cannot, <laughs> exactly. I cannot disagree. Um, <laughs> now I, I have, you know, kind of changing, changing lanes a little bit, uh, you know, especially now with your very wide reaching, very well-received TikTok content, I think many people know uh, that in addition to being an author, a researcher, a science communicator, you're also a mother to a daughter named Delta. How does she feel about her mom becoming an astronaut? Uh, she is so excited. And, you know, I know you've seen her content, but she, she loves like talking to people. She's very exuberant in that way. And so the hardest part of keeping this news quiet was not me keeping it quiet. It was like, try, like, I, I told my toddler too early is what I'm trying to say, because the past few weeks were like, shh, shh. No, like we can't talk to anyone. We can't see anyone. You're a liability. Um, she's so, so excited. Uh, and, I, you know, it's really special for me to watch and, and for my husband, Stephen, to watch too, because it's like she, I, 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 what am I trying to say? It was basically like the impact of like, you know, less than a thousand humans have been to space, less than a hundred women and only like a handful of moms. And that was my generations framework growing up like knowing those things subconsciously it's like your your chances maybe that's not the right framing for it are like pretty small in that category at the end of that funnel right but for delta's generation and the one that follows it's like her framework growing up is like oh this is flying to space is just something moms do like you know it's like natural and so i think back like what would it mean if i had grown up with a framework of like, of course, that's the most natural thing in the world that an astronaut happens to be a mom or happens to be, you know, insert any other kind of um, adjective there. And so I, I think it's just really exciting. And to me, that's like probably the most rewarding part of, of the entire journey. That's so incredible. Um, yeah, it's so, it's so incredible to watch your journey and also you and her journey, you know, together. Her, uh, the tiniest science communicator. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yes, it's super special. <laughs> so I have just one last question. Thank you again. Thank you to, to all of you for being so generous with your time, um, especially at such an exciting moment. Um, now, you know, I know that Delta, your family, everyone who has followed your journey is really beyond thrilled for your success, excited for your mission, getting their plane tickets to space port America, <laughs> just in case. Um, however, you know, we have seen how dangerous space flight can be. Um, you know, especially in this new era of commercial space flight, while we continue to see successes and safe, safely landed missions time after time, there is still inherent risk. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you feel about the inherent risks of flying to space. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question because we are at the beginning of the frontier. You know, when I think about Virgin Galactic in particular, I think about their commitment to safety culture throughout. I think about the fact that, you know, their test flight program, you know, they're, they're not a company that bends to public demands of like, fly now, fly, fly faster. It's like they will fly when they are ready to fly and safety comes first. And that's something that's so important to me. And at the same time, it's like, you know, I'm so proud to be a part of, of that moment at the beginning of, of this real phase of making everything sort of repeatable and and so much more accessible and so i you know space you know that's what test flight programs are designed to do they're designed you know in any company to push envelopes and you know make sure that we, you've you've tested everything really with safety in mind and so i you know i look at virgin galactic and i just i couldn't be more proud or more ready to fly <laughs>